Welcome back to the Equip for Life podcast. This is part two with my friend Monica Snyder from Check Over for Life. If you didn't listen to the last episode, stop. Don't be dumb. Go back. Listen to part one. This is all building on that. We're not going to repeat stuff from that. That was like an hour or I mean, something. we might, but... We're, so we're just like, <laughs> let's just like continue the conversation okay. because I'm trying not to do three hour long podcast episodes, which I'm so tempted to basically do with you. And by the way, I'm curious if you would be interested in us doing two to three hour long podcast, let me know if you would, if you want that, because I'm open to it. I like the Joe Rogan, Sam Harris, like the like people doing the long form. It's podcast. like one or the other. It's either TikTok. Or Joe Rogan, Sam Harris. Right. Those are the options. So I've been trying to keep us roughly to like an hour in, but I'm wondering if our audience is changing on that because if I they are, be, I'm your girl because yes. I am not concise is we not one of my easily talents. Easily do yeah. two, three hour <laughs> podcast together. So okay. So on what should pro lifers do, you had a really interesting question, discussion question that you added to your outline for this that we've never talked about before, but it seems like of course we should, because we should be defining our terms. And so you're asking, what does the pro-life movement mean? What is that? And yeah, so, how do we define pro-life movement? So like, what do you think are like some of the options there? So it depends on how far outside of it you are. Mm-hmm. I think way outside of it, they think it means Republican politicians. That's mm-hmm. what they think that it means, mm-hmm. uh, which is really unfortunate because I think way inside of it, that's like an afterthought, actually. Mm. So it could be... What do you mean be, by that? I mean... When I'm doing pro-life activism, Republican politicians or any politicians really are sort of a a side topic where we want to figure out how to interface with them to get them to propose the legislation we want or support or or oppose the legislation we want. But I don't necessarily consider them pro-life. They might be pro-life. But to be frank, I'm totally agnostic on that. When it comes to politicians, I believe they are what they need to be to keep their jobs. Yeah. And, and we're going to find out now. I mean, there's We so, are finding out we are, now. <laughs> we kind of knew. I mean, we, we I, yeah. I heard people talking about that even before Dobbs Of course. Was a thing. So they're like they're just but using like, this as a wedge issue to get votes. And the other side says that about their side too. Quick side note. Yeah. Right after Dobbs happened and then all of a sudden the Democrats were saying, "You got to vote for us so that we can codify Roe." And I have friends who are Democrats who are like where you been the last several decades? You could have done that the whole time. So both sides mm-hmm. have this problem yes. where they're like, you don't care about what we care about. You yeah. care about us voting and donating to you. Yeah. And I'm sure there are politicians out there who are sincere. I'm not saying literally nobody, but it's not their main focus. Right. At, at, at best, it's not their main focus. Right. And so outside of the pro-life movement, when they talk about the pro-life, and we, we see this all the time when people say, oh, you... They're commenting on an SPL tweet and they would say, you say you care, but then you vote against this, this, and this. I'm like, I've literally never voted against any of those things. Do you mean me or do you mean like Ted Cruz? Who are you talking to? You know? Those are very different people. Because we are obviously one in the same <laughs> total monolith. All right. And so, and so when you say pro-life, when people say, why didn't the pro-life movement do this? Why doesn't the pro-life movement do that? Back up a second. Who are you talking about? Right. Right. First this of all. This thing is more diverse than they think. This is what I, I really like this thing that Jacob said one time trying to explain this i remember trying to explain this to the pro-lifers in, in ireland when i was there because there's like you need to understand this is what's going to happen to you too which is that for the normal not inside the pro-life or pro-choice movement person just the normal right. person right if they drive by jacob on the sidewalk doing sidewalk counseling at the abortion clinic where he often is in Georgia, there's multiple groups. There's another group with bullhorns and sure. big graphic signs, and they are in their mind all the same Bible group. verses that people. And then you've got these people over here that are just like praying the rosary, and it's like, and they think this is all the same group, and it's really, really not. Yes, the movement. I mean, you are proof that the movement is a well, very and we have that happen place. all the time. Where people say, "Well, you guys say this," and I'll sometimes I'll say, "If you could find anywhere." On any of our platforms in 12 years that I've ever said that, I will give you $100. I have literally right. never said that never because I don't think that. Right. But, I, but I, I shouldn't be so harsh because, like you said, if it's kind of low information, not really involved, you get these vague ideas and then you react. I mean, we all do right. it. Right. So who is the pro-life movement? I don't think there's one single answer. One time years ago, and we should do this again, we did a poll to test people's intuitions about this. Okay, let me back up. There's two questions. Who's the pro-life movement and who is pro-life? Okay. Yeah. Those are different things. Yes. I'll focus. I'll focus up. Who is the pro-life movement? In my opinion, the pro-life movement, broadly speaking, is everybody who does pro-life activist work. 
that is my opinion. And so that includes people who work for pro-life organizations. Mm -hmm. It includes people who don't formally work for pro-life organizations, but have volunteered for them yep. or even donated to them. I consider donations activist work. Mm -hmm. It includes people who aren't involved with the legislative side, but they, they yep. might do sidewalk counseling. Yep. It includes people who donate to crisis pregnancy centers. If you are pro-life and you have done literally anything about it yeah. ever, Okay. Yeah. Then I consider you at least nominally part of the pro-life movement. Me too. That's like okay. literally. I mean, I I I was I was wondering if you would have the same definition, mm -hmm. and that is the way that I think about it. I would just say like sometimes when we use the phrase pro-life movement, I know that I'm sometimes using it just to mean like the big organizations, and like I'm right. I'm referencing sometimes them. you mean you know SBA, SFLA, LA, blah, 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 whatever, and right. sometimes you mean everybody on the Gallup poll that said they're pro-life, and those are not We're, the same. Right. Not the same at all. Yes. You know, yeah. so it's a tricky thing, um, but it's important to clarify because we were talking in the first part of this mm -hmm. uh, series about the amendments that didn't pass. And a lot of times you'll see people say, why doesn't the pro-life movement take this strategy? Why don't they do that? I just right. want to clarify every one of those amendments and the people working for or against them are different people in different groups. And there was yeah. some national involvement, some national organizations trying to help here and there sure. with different things. I'm not saying there isn't, but the idea that the pro-life movement is some kind of monolith choosing what to support and what not to, even within no, the same not. state, you will have different groups with different priorities, yeah. you know? And sometimes the different priorities are just different focuses. Like some people's heart is with supporting women in crisis pregnancies, and some people's heart is in having debates, and some people's heart is in donating to politicians. Sometimes it's just different focuses. Sometimes it's literally contradictory priorities, where you will have, you know, abolitionists on one end, and you'll yep. have incrementalists on another. There's all kinds of ways you can divide this out. Right. And so on the outside looking in, they're like, why does your movement, my movement? Right. What, I wish, movement? man. Right. I am not in charge. If I, mean, I was in charge, it'd look differently. Think in contrast. So, like, I've had at least two or three times some donor or volunteer tell me, you know what the pro-life movement needs? Like, they're going to tell me now, like, the solution. Like, if only yes. everyone understood what I understood. Because yeah. this, oh, this happens to me all the time. Yes. So, but they're like, here's what, here's what we need. If we just did this. Right. What we need is our own version of Planned Parenthood. We need one massive pro-life group that like shares all the they funding. They are very organized. Shares all the office Shares space. all the color schemes. So then you're then you're paying less than like these fixed costs and we'll unify the whole thing because everyone cares about pro-life unity. Well, not everyone, but like there's a lot of people that care about pro-life unity. Could be and more efficient. If we just did that, okay. They're comparing. They're wrong anyway. Like, there's no Planned way. Planned is also not a monolith, by the way. They got plenty right. of internal strife. Exactly. You've got, like, and you and I were talking about They're this They're doing the what, the, what we're, the opposite we're talking about. We're way outside Planned Parenthood, vaguely looking at them, and we see, like, this one Twitter account. Mm. They're not, they're not, if you even look at um, other abortion clinics and smaller abortion funds, there's a lot of internal strife in the pro-choice yes. movement about what they should be doing, what their right. strategy should be. There's strife between abortion providers and pro-choice activists. There's strife between mm -hmm. people that are more local and people that are more national. And they've, they've... People who do who do the abortions think about it super differently than the yes. people who are like lobbying and, and talking about it. And some people think the most it. important thing is hearts and minds, and some people think the most important thing is legislation, and some people yep. think the most important thing is abortion funds, and some yep. people think the most important thing is abortion pills. Yep. Yep. And and they have, you know, the same issue. We, it, it almost, this sounds weird. It almost endears me to them because I'm like, dude, I know. <laughs> this is, this is <laughs> <Right>. difficult. <laughs> so it's like, hey, look, people, do the math. If the pro-choice side, which has Planned Parenthood, which has a literal billion-dollar nonprofit yeah. on their side, plus narrow and, and a couple of, like, the know, big groups that people know about, if they are as divided as they are, wow. then... <laughs> The pro life. What does it mean when you say what? Why doesn't your movement do this thing? Or I do wish that we had some kind of better communication because what I do see sometimes that's yes. really frustrating is you'll have Group A doing Project A, yeah. and then Group X doesn't know that and they start Project A also, yeah. and it's literally yeah. the same project, and yeah. it's and they don't know. Well, some, it's, and it's sometimes difficult. that happens on purpose because they are intentionally trying to compete with each other. Sometimes, like, but a lot of times too. they just I. I I've had project ideas where I'll start it and then I'll realize someone has started it already and it would mm -hmm. be so much more efficient for me to come alongside them and be like, right. how can I support you already right. doing it? But I didn't know. And it's and it's but it's very difficult to keep track of. You are also more collaborative than some pro-life leaders are. So there's, there's, sure, there's, both sure. of those things are a thing and I'm pessimistic because I've been around. I'm feeling good right now because I was in D.C. not that long ago and I went to a conference where the whole point of the conference was that a larger pro-life organization had all of this consumer research and they were like, please take this, use it for whatever you want. Yeah. And it was it was really nice because their, that whole conference's theme was how do we unify the pro-life movement? And, and yeah. it was one of the larger organizations and even they were like, 
I don't know. Here's what we're figuring out. What's working right. for you guys? What can we do to help support your groups? And, right. and even with those efforts, it's really, really tricky. How many pro-life organizations do you think there actually are? Like or formal organizations, you know? I mean, just national or are you adding a state no, and local? No, everything. State and local, hundreds at least. Easily hundreds. Probably more. There's probably, there's like got to be at least a thousand once you yeah. add that, I would think. Yeah. But there's a lot. It's a lot. And they're all made up of very different kinds of people and with different kinds of experiences in yep. different ages and different yep. places on the political spectrum. And we fight a lot and, and we have a lot. And of even if we did it, we don't always know what each other are doing. It's, it's yes. so when people say, why didn't the pro life movement have this reaction to this amendment? And then of course you have hindsight bias and all these other things, right. but um, it's, it's much more complicated than that. And that's not to say there's no room for critique or improvement. Right. There totally right. is. But also keep in mind, who do you, who are you talking about when you say the pro life movement? Yeah. And again, I think a, a big distinction is between, politicians ostensibly supporting pro-life goals and actual pro-life activists. In fact, we even saw this in Dobbs. So hmm. obviously I'm glad that Dobbs went the way it did, but I was there outside the Supreme court during oral arguments and I reread hmm. the oral arguments later. And I thought that they could have been much stronger, but I understand mm -hmm. because the person making them was not a pro-life activist. Yeah. He is an attorney who covers many different things. Right. And this was one of them. There were, there were things they asked him that you or I could have answered oh, in yeah. great detail because yeah. this is all we do, right. you know, we but that's into, not him. We he's, did such a long deep dive after the oral arguments. He's not a pro-lifer like, who's an attorney. Yeah. He's an attorney who's trying to do a pro-life yeah. thing. And that's yeah. not the same thing. And to be fair, I think the other side felt the same way where if they were in there, they would have asked different questions or yeah. had different responses. Those of us who do this every single day, yeah. of course, it's going to feel that way. Right. You know? Yeah. So first it's like, what do we mean by the pro-life movement? And here we're kind of talking about anyone who, anyone who opposes abortion enough to do anything about it. And I mean, anything, I mean, talk about it day to day. Mm -hmm. How many people do you think privately oppose abortion and never speak of it or do anything? It's probably at least tens of thousands. Yeah. And, and on the other side too, probably this is not, more. this is not an indictment of anybody. I'm just saying there, yeah. uh, there are um, layers to this. There are tiers of how involved people are. Yeah. Right. So right now I'm not talking to the people who are privately pro-life and don't want to get involved. That's mm -hmm. a different conversation. Although I do want you to get involved, but that's a mm -hmm. different conversation. But for people who are involved, they've tracked these amendments that just didn't pass. They're tracking what's going on politically and legislatively and they're feeling overwhelmed. They're feeling like we're losing a lot of ground, which I argued in the first part. No, we're not. We are way ahead. But I get how recency bias it feels like we are. What can they do? That's the question. And I argue that actually there's always something somebody can do. There's always something you can do. Always. Whether you're broke, whether you're busy, whether you're an introvert, mm -hmm. there's always work you can do. Now, before I continue, I will plug my mm -hmm. side project. You have this, a website for I this. I have a website for this. <laughs> I would love to expand it greatly, but it's still got a lot of stuff on it right now. Now, this is, I want to clarify. It's not specifically a secular project. It is a collaborative project. Yeah. We consulted with you. We consulted with a whole bunch of different groups. Yeah. This is a collaborative project, which is why when you go to it, you will see that I think one out of like every 10 items is a religious related thing you can do. And mm -hmm. I am not religious. Okay. Because right. the whole point of this project is that everyone can do something, which includes people who are religious, mm -hmm. obviously, right. but it is called howtobeprolife.com. And it's literally just a list and you can sort it. You can sort it if you are busy, if you're broke, if you're introverted, or you can just read That's through the so whole thing. Cool. And, and again, right now it has 52 ideas on it, one for each week of a full year, but we hope to add more to it in the future. But it includes things like things you can do. If you're an introvert, for example, and you don't want to talk to other mm -hmm. people about this necessarily, mm -hmm. okay, you can write a thank you note to a local city council member who did something useful in the pro-life realm and just be mm. like, I supported that. That mm. is pro-life work. Yeah. You can have a postcard party, okay, mm -hmm. where you invite just people you're comfortable with, two people, and you can just get all these postcards and write thank you notes to the right people, or mm -hmm. you can write suggestion notes, okay? If you're more extroverted, you can go in person. And this is all like legislative related, but it doesn't have to be legislative right, related. Right. There are so many things you can do that crisis pregnancy centers need help with, that sidewalk counselors need help with. Say you're not confrontational enough to do sidewalk counseling. Mm -hmm. Welcome to 85% of the population, okay? Yeah. But 
thigh walk counselors do emotionally grueling work Mm -hmm. and it could be pro-life work for you to just drop by and say, would you like me to pick you up a cup of coffee? Mm. I care about what you're doing. I appreciate you. Oh my gosh. Having been on the sidewalk before, that would have been so amazing. And even if they say, I don't need a cup of coffee, that's not the point. Yeah. The point is not everybody is screaming at them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the point. Or if that's not your thing, or maybe you don't believe in sidewalk counseling. I'm not saying that you do. I'm saying... If you don't want to take a frontline role, then take a support role to them. If you don't want to take a role with activists, then find people in your community who need help. You can Students for Life of America has a million ideas of ways you can help make campuses more pro-life, which is super important because disproportionately women in their late teens, early 20s are the ones often getting abortions. Okay, And how can you support them? Do their campuses have policies? that support pregnant women. Is there a lactation room? Is mm-hmm. there a lactation room? Mm-hmm. Speaking as someone who has breastfed four children, we notice if there's a lactation room or not, okay? <laughs> I don't mean a bathroom. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be a spa. It could just be right. a place that is private that has a lock, okay? Yeah. There are things you could do. You could contact local schools and find out what their policies are for those things. Mm-hmm. Or if you don't want to even be that, that confrontational, you can just, we talked about this in the last episode, If nothing else, if nothing else, you can just let people in your life know if they don't already that you don't agree with abortion and you think it's problematic. That sounds very small. It is not very small. Our side suffers from what I call a smaller megaphone. I Mm -hmm. firmly, firmly believe that on a cultural national level, there are major institutions who are much more on the pro-choice side than ours. Totally and yep. and they give out information, not necessarily untrue information. Some of it is untrue, but okay. some of it is just right. asymmetric in the sense of you're focusing on some information and not other information. That's actually the most insidious form. And one of them is you focus on certain kinds of stories, not other kinds of stories. And that leaves people who aren't super into this with this overall impression of who pro-lifers are and what it means. Hmm. And so the way an individual private pro-life person can fight that is to be friends with people who aren't identical to you and let them know that you don't agree. That's it. That's all you got to do. If you want to talk about it, if you want to debate it, you can do that. And I would say too, by the way, when you're having these conversations in your private life with your family, with your friends, and if you dare with your coworkers, you don't have to convince them. In fact, I would argue, and I don't know if you would agree with this, I would not even go into the conversation trying to convince them. And I would emphasize to them that you aren't trying to convince them. Just trying to explain where you're coming from. You don't need to make them feel defensive or like they need to convince you. You could just say, this is how I feel about it. And you can, you know, think whatever you think. And I have had at least uh, all the time I was in California and I had no pro-life friends. I had plenty of times when I would let people, and it often wouldn't be in that same moment. You know, I'd just say, oh, this is how I feel about this. Right. But later down the line, weeks, months, years. People would be like, hey, so, so for example, I have one friend who I've been friends with, very close friends with for years. Mm -hmm. And like four or five years into it, she's visiting me at my house and she says, I actually, I have a question about like abortion. And I was like, I can talk about whatever you want, you know? (laughs) And she says, and she's not in this debate. She's not an activist. She's pro-choice in the nominal way. And she says, do you worry about overpopulation? Mm -hmm. And, and I'm like, that is a good question. So let me elaborate for you and then i give her like you know if you want to understand my perspective here's where here's the premises she knew nothing about the debate nothing about the debate at all so i'm not gonna come and be like oh my gosh i can't i've heard this a million times no don't they're putting their toes in the water they're stepping out of their comfort zone but they only they were only able to do that because i told them that i was against abortion right otherwise would have never come up right that's what i'm saying so if you are seeing these amendments not getting passed and you're wishing that Michigan had, you know, 200 million more dollars and was able to do something, yes, I agree. But that doesn't mean there's nothing for you to do here. It is not enough. It is not enough for us to sit and say, well, the pro-life movement should have done it this way. You might be right. I'm not even saying you're wrong. I'm just right. saying you can always do something. And if you are critiquing, you better be working, okay? Okay. Right. You can always do something. And if you don't want to have any conversations, you don't want to talk to sidewalk counselor, you don't want to talk to your friends, you don't want to write letters to the editor, you don't want to do postcards, you don't want to put yourself out there at all, okay, your money is a conversation too. Yeah. You can be donating, and if it's not to us, and it should be to us, but if it's not to us and it's not to Equal Rights Institute, it doesn't have to be to us. There's a million organizations yeah. that could use the help, yeah. okay? And it doesn't even have to be money. It could be in-kind donations. There's yep. all sorts of things you can oh. Do you shop on Amazon? Do you shop on Amazon? Did you know that Amazon has what's called Amazon Smile and you Mm -hmm. can pick a nonprofit and they will give a percentage of your purchases to that nonprofit at no extra cost to you? It's not a large. We actually just did the math on the go. We were were 
writing a fundraising email about this. Sure. We did, we did the math. So we have, since the year I began, brought in roughly $1,300 in Amazon Smile. Gifts. That is amazing. That literally paid for our new third camera. See? That's so, these, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. So you nope. could do Amazon Smile. You can ask your employers if they do match percentages to charities. Mm-hmm. A lot of times there's a 501c3. Um, you, there's a lot, or you could, you know what you could do? And this is important. People don't understand this. Instead of thinking, well, I don't even have $100 to give to these guys. Can you do five bucks a month? Right. Monthly recurring donors yep. provide money, but yep. they also provide stability mm-hmm. and predictability. Mm-hmm. Five, we literally have donors that give us five or ten dollars a month, and they are part of my core team yeah. because they have committed over a long term. You don't want to be dependent on one person giving a hundred. No, grand although or we love it when like you do that. that. That's yes. wonderful. Yes. But the, okay. but there's there's but you there's, don't want to only have that. You don't have to have a ton of money stable. to help. We we had a college yeah. student come to us. Do you know how broke I was in college? I was fantasizing about someday being able to buy fresh produce without feeling guilty about it because I was so broke in college. That's the joke about you know just eating ramen all the time, right? So do you know how much it meant to me? And we had a college student be like, I can give you $10 a month. I was like, dang, $10? Yeah, that's good for a college Thank student. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. And this, I mean, this, this is just in my head because of what we were just doing like right. yesterday. But like we did that. I, we, I did that math, too. Like if every single person on our email list just gave $10 a month or right. 10 more. Right. It would literally triple our budget. I know. I know. Exactly. <laughs> you think it doesn't make a difference. It makes a difference. It would completely change everything. And if, you don't, if you literally you know? don't have any money and you literally don't want to talk to anybody, what can you do? You can donate your time yes. and, and you can do um, sidewalk chalk. You can ask people if mm-hmm. they need you to transcribe. You know how time consuming transcription is? We now have a team of transcription volunteers and it has changed my life. Hmm. It's changed my life. I'll be like, hey, I did this podcast. Can somebody transcribe it? Sure. They get it back to me in a week. Oh, my gosh. Right. Yeah. You, you could you could. There's lots of things you can do from home that are helpful. Um, do you know how to do graphics? It doesn't have to be gorgeous. But can you literally just take this screen capped tweet and just make it in Canva? Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, there are so many things you can do. And yeah. I'm trying to. Oh, oh, do you like photography? Go to pro-life events. Yes. This is so important. Go to pro-life events. It could yes. be marches. It could be conferences. It could be tabling. It could be speeches. It could be sidewalk counseling. Mm-hmm. Anything. If you are a good photographer, take high-quality photos yep. and then upload them to a royalty-free website, okay? Yep. Let people use them in their yes. work. Give them permission yes. off the bat. And let them send know they're them, there. Send them to the organizations that were involved when you yeah. took them. Here are these pictures that yeah. you can use to talk about what you're doing. You know that, like most Speaking events that we do, we have no pictures. I know, because how are you going to take a picture of yourself while you're talking? You can't. He and, and, and I have taken pictures of each other yeah, at yeah. speeches because nobody else is there to because do it. Because we know, and we and we both know that you have to take like 30 of a, of a speaker to get one good one because mouths are super well, weird Well, or you could just be smarter than we are and take one picture in advance where you're not talking but pretending you, to. Yes, we have occasionally done that. But for the most part. Took me a little part, too long to figure that you out. Just, but. I mean, man, the difference it would make if there was a volunteer photographer at every single thing that we did. Yes. Would, yes. Yeah. And and, and for the spe- for the specific organizations, it's a huge difference. But also, when we're doing blog posts, we try to have an image related to every blog right. post, and we have to have royalty free images, so mm-hmm. we don't, you know, or, or we could take something we took, maybe it's not that good. If you're good, put it on a royalty free website. So yep. Maria Oswald with Rehumanize International has done this, and mm. there's a couple different uses for this. I'm pretty sure she is on Unsplash as Maria Oswald, and she has taken amazing photos of pro-life events that she has granted anyone to use. And so this is great for us to use, but also this is a really big deal. Tons of people use royalty-free websites. And now when they Google like fetus, Mm -hmm. a bunch of pro-life images come up. Mm -hmm. And the first year that she did this, her photos had over 4 million views just for existing on there when there was basically no pro-life content. Okay. So people could look up abortion protest. And 90% of it will be pro-choice stuff. But now Maria Oswald's stuff is up there, too. Think Uh, about that visibility, okay? There's There are so many opportunities. There are so many opportunities. And if you are an artist, even not a graphic artist, it doesn't have to be digital, there is a volunteer, not specific for us, just in general, that makes these beautiful paintings on cardboard. She takes, like, an old cardboard box and makes these amazing paintings and then gives them out at walks for people to hold and then somebody else takes pictures of them and they are very moving and she Mm -hmm. just does that of her own accord because that's her contribution okay um there's there's so many things you can do and so to to bring it all home again we talk about these legislative defeats that's very frustrating and if you are legislatively minded go that route 
Talk to your local and state politicians. Talk to people. Get other people to go with you. Go meet them. Get to know them. Have a conversation with them, right? Um, but if that's not your route, that's not the end of the story, okay? We we are secular pro-life firmly un equivocally believes that the law is a crucial part of this and we have to change the laws. However, mm -hmm. it will never be the only part of this. Hearts and minds are fundamentally important. They're important to get the laws changed. And even mm -hmm. outside the laws, they're important for helping people right where they're at. Mm -hmm. And you can be a part of that conversion. And I know we've talked about this before. Keep in mind too, when you are trying to move the needle and you're trying to get more people to see our perspective on this, almost nobody just changes their mind in a single conversation and wham, bam, they're done. Okay. Almost never. Almost never. Yep. Most people, it will take years. Months or better. Ye yep. Months or better. We have people, some of our most hardcore, passionate activists were pro-choice for 13 years. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't know what role you're playing in moving them and you yep. don't need to worry about yep. it. Your point is, I saw this recently and I thought this was such great phrasing. They said, the way I see it, you're either planting a seed in their hearts or a needle in their conscience, okay? But either way, you're just doing a little like, hey, hey, you know? It could be, we had somebody reach out. They donated to us. I reached out to them. Thank you for donating. Why did you donate, okay? And it turns out they donated because they converted, and they converted because of sidewalk chalk. Not, not literally, oh, sidewalk chalk, I'm converted now. But somebody on their college campus did sidewalk chalk outside of, like, the student cafeteria and it said you know 67 percent of prenatal down syndrome diagnosis and an abortion and the person who saw that the woman who donated to us she worked with special needs kids mm. and she was like that's made up she was pro-choice she was like they just make up anything that's ridiculous but it bothered right. her so she went home and looked it up and it's not made up right. it's true and that was then she wasn't like oh now i'm pro-choice she was like okay well what wait a second and what she starts might i not know? what else might i not know she started following pro-choice and pro-life blogs both mm. She started reading more about it, and and the sidewalk chalk was what started it for her. So you think it doesn't make any difference? You don't know. Like, I'm glad to know that story because I have probably overly underestimated the yes, value of sidewalk yes. chalk. And it's like I'm glad to know that story yes. now. Yes, and, 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 and a lot of sidewalk chalk is oriented toward, you know, outside of clinics, and it'll say, we can help you, here's the number. And I'm not saying that's not important. It is. But you can also just put some of these facts out there. Just... Hey, did you know yeah. this? Hey, did you know that? You know, yeah. and and you don't know who it's you're reaching. It's better than just pro-life. You right, know, pro life is not nothing, but yeah, you want to put something to give them to chew yeah, on. You want to give right? them a possible. Statement. And so, and so, and then her conversion story is really great too, because it started with the sidewalk chalk. Okay. But then as she's following all of this different information, these different blogs, mm -hmm. um, and she's learning about a lot of content that she thought wasn't true, that turns out to be true. That was important, but it was also important for her. And people need to understand this. Is she was also really thrown off as she was following these different online circles with how vitriolic and aggressive and vacuous a lot of the pro-choice voices were mm -hmm. and how respectful and substantial the pro-life ones were. And she clarified, and this is important, she's not saying everybody is like that. Right. She's not saying pro-choice people are this way, pro-life people are that way. And we all know that we you have both that. on both sides. But that's my point. We right. do have both on both sides. Make sure you're one of the good voices, yes. okay? Yes. So... So it's not just what you're saying, although you should know what you're talking about, and we would be happy to help you mm -hmm. with that. Oh, by mm -hmm. the way, another plug, another plug. We have recently unveiled on Secular Pro-Life, the secularprolife.org slash index, what we are calling the Abortion Debate Index. Oh, it's nice. literally a table of contents. Right now it has five categories. It has biology, personhood, bodily rights. Uh, effects of abortion laws, stereotypes of pro-lifers, and then underneath it has common things pro-choice people say, and then our material telling you what you might want to think about when you're responding. And we're going to wow. expand it a lot more. So if you need the content, we got you. But you need to, if you need the demeanor, equal rights has got you, okay? You need to have both. Um, yeah. when, you're, when you're having these dynamics and these conversations, always think about, and uh, we, we've talked about this before, we are mostly online. You guys do more in-person stuff. Right. And so there will be different rules for different things. Yes. But whether you're online or in person, always be thinking about yourself as an ambassador for our cause. Mm -hmm. Okay. You are an ambassador. You are representing pro-life people to this person who may not have a ton of exposure or they may have very bad exposure. Mm -hmm. And so you need to know what you're talking about. You need to be respectful. You don't have to be defensive, yeah. but you need to be, you know, maybe like professional or just, you know, chill. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, when you think of yourself as an ambassador, you need to think about what you're spending your time on. We have, I have a lot of theories about this online. It might be different in person, but whoever you're talking to, certainly online where everything is public, 
remember who's reading it because yeah. I, there's no hard numbers on this, but depending on the forum and depending on the situation, you could have anywhere from 10 to 500 people silently reading your conversation with this person. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking about not just what you are saying, but are you the jerk or is the other person the I jerk? I would argue this is most of the reason to do any online debate it is. is for the other people watching. It actually is. Okay, I'm not saying that you will never change the mind of the person you're directly talking to. Right. It has happened. But, but for the rare. most part, that's not the point. It's actually why, by the way, I, for the most part, will not engage in debates privately. I will not online. Right. It's a waste of my time. No offense. Okay. We actually had someone message the page not that long ago and he was perfectly polite. There was nothing wrong with his demeanor. But you're leading a pro-life group. Like that's yes. not the, sure. you agree like most of the volunt like the people who are not like if they could And it also depends on your relationship with them. It's an online stranger, yes. waste of time. If it's if it's someone you know in person that's talking to you online, probably very yeah. good use of your time. Yeah. So there's a lot okay. of factors we here. Think this yes. But we had this guy message us, totally polite, asking questions I've answered a 50 million times before, right? And I did answer them initially because initially it was easy. Just like, oh, here is my answer to that. Mm -hmm. And then he wants more details, more thing, whatever. And and I I, I am I am always, always overwhelmed with how much I have to do for secular life. I love my job, but mm -hmm. there's always way more to do than I can get done. And I'm very conscientious about what I'm doing with my time. Yeah. And I'm not trying to brush anyone off, but you want me to sit for an hour and talk to you and only you about this thing that a million people have said before. And I'm just, I'm not, I'm not going to. This a lot I'm not going too, to. And I'm failing to to give a lot of people what they want because they're wanting these individual Well, they could also they just like go find it. Really I'm not saying anything I haven't written I before. Like, oh, I didn't even say that. I just stopped. It's on Facebook Messenger. I was just like, I'm, I'm not responding to this anymore. I don't even care. But it's all on our website. It's all all yeah. over the place. But there is something about that also that's going to be true of, of, you know, even some of the people who aren't like professionally doing this all the time where they have a life. They have different, mm -hmm, different mm -hmm. levels of like availability and it's okay to draw boundaries and, and Other prioritize. important boundaries for online conversations. And we post about this after Dobbs when everyone was fighting online more than they usually are. And a lot yeah. of people who don't normally fight about it were fighting about it. And a lot yeah. of people who don't normally fight online were fighting online. And we said a couple things to keep in mind, okay? First of all, you don't have to answer every single question and accusation they have. You can pick one and say, this is what I will talk about first. Mm -hmm. And you could just say that, you know? You don't have, and if they're like, oh, you don't want to answer these questions. You're right, I don't. Because I am a finite human being, you know? So which one do you want me to answer, right. right? You also don't have to answer them within five seconds. You've We've all seen that thing where you're arguing with someone and you don't get back to them within like 30 minutes. Like, oh, right. no response, right. huh? So okay, obnoxious. yeah. I literally was sitting here waiting for you to answer me because you have such great insight and, <laughs> and new information for me. And I was just wondering what it would be. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. I literally don't even... I ignore that they said that completely. Another thing you can do in online debates, if, if you if you have the fortitude, take everything they said, minus out all of the vitriol and trolling, what is the point? And just only address that. Yeah. Try not to match their snark. Yes. Try not to yes. answer every single thing. Just get to the point. And I'm not saying I always do this effectively at all. I am not saying that. I'm just saying you ought to. Right. But so, so... You don't have to answer every single thing they say, and you don't have to answer constantly. In fact, one of my friends, they when Dobbs was happening, they they couldn't resist, and mm -hmm. they were just they were just answering too many things. You know, they, they, it wasn't even that they got invited to. It's like they saw their friend status; they weren't even on it, and they had to go and be like, "Well, but da 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 da," you know. <laughs> so they they went to the other person's table and started talking, and they did it for like six different people. So their solution was they literally set themselves a twenty four hour reminder. And then every 24 hours, they go back and see what was said and answer. And it keeps it from getting too crazy. It keeps it from taking over too much of your life. Yeah. And plus, if you set that cadence, they expect it. As opposed to, like, if you were answering, 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 and then you disappeared. Right. right. Right? So, again, lots of ways you could do it. But, but yeah, have healthy boundaries. You, are, you don't actually owe anybody all of your time and energy, okay? You could put it out there. Uh, one thing I'm a big fan of, and not everyone agrees with this, I do this all the time, is the hit and run comment. All the time. I consider, not everyone agrees with this because they're like, well, then they have a response. You never respond. It looks like you didn't have a response. Maybe, maybe not. I have more to do than I can possibly get done. And if I don't say anything and literally nobody says anything, I consider it the 80 20 rule, right? 20% of the effort for 80% of the result, at least somebody somewhere was like, no, gotta go, you know, whatever. Right. And so I will do it when it's something substantial. So especially on public threads, mm -hmm. you know, not necessarily with a Facebook friend where only friends can see it, but on like public threads, I will often be like, I'll pick one thing. I'm like, that's actually 
not true. If you're interested, here's some information. And then I'll never even look back. I'll immediately mute the thread and forget about it. I won't even be able to find it again because I do it so often. I have no idea where I put all these nuggets, right? But I think it's better than doing nothing because at yeah. least you put it out there. You don't know how many people are going to click on the link. You don't know how many people are going to consider it, right? And, and if you do go back, and I don't recommend it, if you, do, if you really don't want to get too involved, don't go back. Don't look at it again. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But if you do go back, there could be, you know, depending on the thread, eight different people responding to you with different arguments and name calling and stuff, and you never responded. Okay, you never responded. Anybody who is silently reading this and thinking about it at all should be able to recognize that you might not respond to literally every single thing. You know, and, and and a lot of people will refuse to engage entirely because they know they're going to get dogpiled and they feel overwhelmed and then they don't want to go through that. And I don't blame you. But then if we all refuse to engage entirely, only one side is talking and that is not going to work, especially because they're wrong. So, OK, so we've talked about a lot of things that people can be doing. The first thing that I thought of when you sent me a possible podcast called What's the Pro Life Movement Be Doing Right Now was. I mean, just naturally, it's like what's been in my head sure. most. I mean, because like, what should have we be doing post row is like the only thing that I can think about since we heard the oral arguments and dots. It's like, oh my gosh, this is going to happen now. And this is not what I thought was ever going to happen. More and like the dog that caught the car. We are still, I've, I have completely agreed with this analogy. The pro life movement is like the dog that caught the car for the first time and is now trying to figure out what now. There is some truth to that because most of us didn't think that this could happen. Right. And a lot of the stuff that we can do now couldn't have been done before. So there is a like kind I've of heard, experimental I've heard some of it. Talk about this, like pro life kind of 3.0 of kind of like right. there is we need to drop a lot of the assumptions that the we have before. generation. Right. Yeah. We are now the post pro generation. Mm. Yeah. So so so, so I'm thinking a, a lot not just about what we should be doing but what should we not be doing? Okay. Like I think of this as a really fragile moment at, Could definitely at a, go a lot better or worse. societal level. Yes. I don't want the prohibition thing to happen. Right. And for, you know, some kind of, you know, federal codifying row amendment or no, something to get my passed. Gosh, like, no. Hopefully that doesn't happen. I mean, in the end, the timing is the timing. This bit that they made it a Supreme Court issue. And then the Supreme Court test has been going on for 45 years. And sure. now here now we maybe are. This, other so new this, different is, thing. this is where we're at. Yep. But, Trying to think of how can we not do a ton of damage right now. How do we not screw this up? <laughs> not screw this up. So I've got like four unforced errors for us to avoid that I've been talking about lately. I did this in a speech. I don't. I hopefully if we can finally clarify get the video from unforced them. errors versus what that means? forced errors. Okay. So so like in tennis, an unforced error would be like. Like if you screw up your serve really bad, or if sure. you just like if you completely screw up on your own, there accord, was no reason that had to happen. It's not because they had a really good shot at you, and then you you That's missed a particularly it or bad kind of error. It's, you did not have to mess that up, and you did mess that up, and it's it's, it's the worst really kind unnecessary. Of up. That's what I mean. And I almost never use sports metaphors because I'm not a sports guy, but for whatever reason. So, okay. Okay. Makes so sense. I'm interested in your reaction because I don't think you've heard at least all four of these. You, okay. It depends on how much you've been able to pay attention to us lately. Because oh, was I it on TikTok? I might have seen it. I don't. It possibly. That it prob, pro, uh, probably. Emily, Emily is pretty amazing TikTok on TikTok. Yes. Probably. Okay. So the first one, we need to be really careful about including clear life of the mother exceptions in abortion bans. Yes. Like the states that are able to pass the really big substantive protections on the unborn. They need. And do you to think have, they are not? I think usually by the end of the process, they do. Right. I think there have, from what I can tell, that there have been a couple of times that bills have been like initially proposed with without it. Right. And a lot of times that gets fixed very in committee. unforced error. Super unforced. But it's error. like the fact that it ever happened. Right. Is really Why really are you bad. So bad at this? And yes. it's like, look, I'm glad that there are apparently at least a few politicians who are actually pro-life enough to do something about it. And pay it attention, yeah. And, 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 are, and are trying. And I'm kind of just assuming they're doing their best and they are accidentally screwing something up. But, but it's screwing it up at a national level. We do, like, there are, I, I believe, and, and people know, I am a very charitable guy when it comes to pro-choice people. But I do firmly believe at this point, I've seen enough evidence that there are pro-choice doctors on TikTok that are intentionally, knowingly lying 
about this stuff. About, Can I give an example yes, just to please. hit on that a little yeah. bit more? Okay. Not all the laws are written with the same language. Not all of them are. Some are more clear than others. Yep. Not denying that. Yep. But Texas was the test case with the heartbeat law. Mm -hmm. And what they did, and you can look up this language yourself, um, they defined abortion as a legally, legally, abortion is defined as blah, 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 whatever they said. Mm -hmm. And then they said, what is not legally an abortion are the following. And they listed a couple different things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they said is any treatment of ectopic pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to, I want to explain this for a second, yeah. because what you will hear is people will say, oh yeah, they said you could treat ectopic pregnancy if her life is in danger. Because they said they defined abortion as this and this and this, but there's an exception if her life is in danger. But then right. you have to wait to make sure her life is sufficiently in danger. No. They said any treatment of ectopic pregnancy is not an abortion. So the life exception to abortion right. doesn't even matter right. because any treatment of ectopic pregnancy is not an abortion. And they did not say, they did not say, oh, if you are doing this particular procedure or this particular medication right. in these particular circumstances, and it's super confusing, they just literally said, if it's treating ectopic pregnancy, right. it's not an abortion. You could not possibly be clearer. It's not, as far as I can see, possible to be clearer. This is, this right? is definitely a common language thing in some of the state bills. Yes, I think not, not all, all of, them. of them. Not all of them, but and I'm not yes. saying it's all of them, but I'm saying then yeah. you hear these stories out of Texas, and some of them have been, oh, what if you can't get treatment for an ectopic pregnancy? What are you talking about? Right. They couldn't possibly be clear that this is not meant to touch that at all. Some of them go even worse than that. They don't even just say you can't get treatment. They're saying they want women to not get treatment. What are you talking about? Okay, so I, I will get to that. I think there is a reason why they're saying that, or at least sometimes a so, reason that it's not. Again, emphasizing this is not every bill and yes. not every bill. But one more yes. point I want to make. Yeah. To the extent that we aren't being clear enough in our language, whether it's life of the mother exception or other kinds of exceptions mm -hmm. like miscarriage management, mm -hmm. we need to be. And one of the things that we need to have is pro-life medical professionals interfacing with legislatures to help them craft the correct language. Yeah. It's not yeah. just to give yeah. them the right information. It's also to give them confidence that they are doing this correctly. There are some non-zero number mm -hmm. of ostensibly pro-life legislatures, legislators, excuse me, who would be interested in this, but they don't want to touch it because they're afraid they're going to screw it up. And if they have the right people, so A, plug the, the pro-life OBGYNs, they, they are asking more and more people, especially if you're in the correct state for it, to get in touch with them. They are trying to be involved with legislators at every level to give them advice, to give them input. You don't even have to formally sign anything. You don't have to go public or anything. You just need to be there to be like, hey, you can literally call up their office and be like, here's who I am. Here's what I know. If you're ever thinking about this, please keep me in mind. I'd be happy to give you input. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, by the way, also they do witness training. So if you want to be more public about it, they really, really could mm. use the help of pro-life medical professionals to give expert witness during legislative sessions about what would and would not be likely in a medical setting. If all you have is abortion providers, I'm not just talking about pro-choice activists. I'm talking about literally just abortion providers giving input on this stuff. You already know which way it's going to go. Yeah. That's my rant. Go yeah. ahead. No, so I'm so I'm with you. And you kind of bring me to another kind of thing that I was going to say, and 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 something that we talked about in a in a podcast recently, which is that I basically think that most pro life people define the word abortion in a way that is unhelpful for clear communication. I think there's equivocation between pro life and pro choice people and the word abortion. I don't think it really mattered too much before Dobbs. I think Dobbs made it very clear that people are using it to mean all kinds of different things. Yeah. And so pro-life people typically, I think, want to use it to mean an intentional, elective, you're trying to kill a baby procedure. Yes. And they want to be able to then be able to say, I am a 100% no exceptions pro life -er. So here's yes. the problem, though. We are the only ones that use the word that way. For choice people... I mean, doctors use it way more broadly sometimes, depending on the doctor, depending on the, the group. Spontaneous abortion or incomplete abortion or all right. kinds of things. Yes. Like all these different things. And then, like, generally, you've just got kind of like, what do, like, normal people think of the word abortion? Right. And since most people would use the word abortion more broadly than pro-lifers, the, pro the equivocation that happens, the miscommunication that happens, that at least I'm concerned about, is when pro-choice people hear from lying pro-choice doctors on TikTok that were trying to kill women who have ectopic pregnancies. And then that person hears their pro-life friend say, I am a no exceptions yep, pro-life. Yep. I am against 100% abortions. Then what they hear is something different TikTok than what the pro-life right. guy. Yeah. They are hearing us say, we think you women should have to commit suicide via pregnancy. Yep. 
And so... Side note. Yes. Incoherent. Let's say that it was true that we are evil and we hate women. Let's say that that was true. Okay. Okay. And all we care about is fetuses because we worship and obsess over fetuses. Let's say that that was true. Okay. The fetus will still die. What? Why would we, even in that ridiculous description of ourselves, why would we want both the woman and the fetus to die? Yeah. So, so I, I basically think, and and I know off the air, you've got like a really cool thing uh, to, to add to this, but like, I'm just basically like, minimally speaking, pro lifers, when they describe their view, if they, if they're going to get their elevator pitch moment, they get the opportunity. They need to make sure that they are making a clear life of the mother exception and and i think that they ought to define abortion i think they should basically say elective abortion i have two points for this or be very over the top specific about what they mean when they say they're like what are you against and what are you for if you are okay with people intervening which almost all pro-lifers are in an ectopic pregnancy they need to understand that yes exactly so actually several points first point Secular pro-life, when generally speaking, when people say, do you make any exceptions about abortion? One mm-hmm. of the first things they say is if her life is in danger and the only solution is abortion, we think she should be able to get that. Yes. Now, that's me glossing over a lot of nuance in the way we define abortion is treatment of ectopic pregnancy and abortion and all these other things. But that doesn't matter. I'm just getting to the heart of the point. Yeah. Nobody thinks that a woman should have to die because we are against right. abortion. That's the first thing. OK, I just go straight to it. And for a lot of people, that question is sincere. Now, there's a lot of activists where they're trying to trip you up. But for a lot of everyday people, that's a sincere question. Yeah. Secondly, a lot of times, instead of saying elective abortion, because remember, we talk about this constantly, but yeah. our target audience is people who don't talk about this constantly. Right. And they might even have a really clear idea what you mean by that. So yeah. often what I will say is, what do you think of the 95% plus of abortions in this country where the abortion is of a healthy fetus carried by a healthy woman with no medical emergency? I love that. That's what I say. I think that's so good. I, I, I can't be think clear. People I guess technically that. you could just say where it involves no medical emergency. But just to really emphasize the point, no. we're not talking about any fetal disability. No. We're not talking about any any issue. It has nothing to do with physical medical health. What do you think about that? I think every single time a pro-life person gives their elevator pitch on why they're pro-life, they need to say that. Yes, because I think, this is just speculation, based on the playbook the other side is using and based on the way things are going, mm-hmm. I suspect that the average American who's not that into this thinks that like half of abortions are for medical emergencies or some, or some ridiculous or proportion. Lot, 20, some insane amount like of that. times, yeah. right? Yeah. When it's actually almost never the case. Right. And that's not even getting into the fact that we are trying, and I think sometimes succeeding, sometimes not, to craft laws that make exceptions for that anyway. So that is the second thing. But the third thing I want to emphasize, this is yeah. super important, Okay. We want to make a delineation between elective abortion and medically necessary abortion for the mm-hmm. reasons you just explained, right. because people people think of those differently. And I've said this before, polls show that Americans broadly, broadly support medically necessary abortion and right. much less so non-medically necessary abortion. Right. It is totally different. OK, yep. so we have every reason to make the delineation. The other side has every reason not to make that delineation. Yeah. OK, and they are trying not to on purpose. This isn't me being paranoid. ACOG just released a language guide a couple months ago. They had 13 phrases that they want us to stop saying. They claimed it was all for medical accuracy. One of them did have a medically related reason. OK, um, one, one out of, of them did. eight. Out of 13. Out of 13. One out of oh, 13. Okay. Had wow. a medically related reason. The rest of them were basically just ACOG saying, um, we don't want you to think badly about abortion. Okay. And oh. one of the 13 phrases they said we shouldn't use ever again is elective abortion. What? They don't want you to say elective abortion because they don't think it's up to third parties to judge whether her reason is good enough or not. That has nothing to do of with medicine. It doesn't. No, it has nothing to do with medicine. Elective is definitely a term used in the medical field. Forget the, the abortion time. debate. Forget the abortion debate. Yep. It's just all the time. Elective versus emergent. Elective versus therapeutic. An elective C-section. It's 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 also used in billing for insurance. In fact, mm-hmm. we just covered recently the death of Keisha Atkins. She sought a six month abortion in New Mexico, and they fraudulently signed paperwork saying it was for all these medically necessary reasons. And you ask, why would they do that? New Mexico has no gestational limits on abortion. They don't even need to, they don't even have to say it's medically necessary. They can do it for any reason. So why would they lie? So they could bill Medicaid because Medicaid won't cover it unless it's for medically necessary reasons. Uh, so the medical side is not confused about if there's a difference between elective or not. They just don't want us talking about it. ACOG doesn't want us talking about it. Why do you think that is? Why don't they, they don't want, us, want about it? us judging they also don't want us, con- they don't want us judging and they don't want us conveying to Americans what proportion of abortions are not for medically necessary reasons. It's yeah. not a coincidence yeah. that when you talk to pro-choice activists, for the most part, they will go right to, 
Um, this woman was trying to get treatment for a miscarriage and she almost died. And this woman was trying to get treatment for an ectopic pregnancy and she almost died. And don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. We do have to address that. Mm -hmm. We have to address those situations and yep. make sure we are not putting Absolutely. people in danger. I'm not saying we shouldn't, yeah. but they would rather talk about anything than elective abortion. Yes. They would rather talk about miscarriage. They would rather talk about ectopic pregnancy. They'd rather talk about gay marriage. They'd rather talk about contraception. They'd rather talk about yep. anything, yep. anything other than elective abortion. And do you know why? Because Americans don't like elective abortion. Yep. In fact, yep. I just read a study that came out recently where they had a pro-choice audience, including a couple abortion providers and other people who've like volunteered to do pro-choice activism. So not even just nominally pro-choice, but a very pro-choice audience okay. watched the documentary After Tiller, which puts as much of a sympathetic spin really on late-term abortion yep. as you possibly could. Yep. You shouldn't even call it a documentary. That's a different rant. So they had an already agreeable audience watch a very um, positive yeah. documentary on late-term abortion, and then they interviewed them afterwards about their impressions. And they did find that after watching it, they were more sympathetic about late-term abortion than they had been before. They yeah. did find that. And even then, they still were only okay with it if it was medically necessary, basically. They still wow. were saying things like, yes, I see why this might be necessary for these dire situations. I see why, given the right reasons. Like, they were having these caveats. And the people doing the research who are, who are you know, strident abortion rights activists, they were contextualizing the research saying— Okay, so we still have work to do because they they got better, but they still think there should be still limits. Have this problem. Yeah, yes, they're like they still think they're still judging like based on the reasons when we're trying to say that it's their autonomy and whatever, right. you know. Right. Um, they don't want us to talk about elective abortion. Huh. So for the pro-life people who are feeling like it should be obvious what abortion means, I'm not even going to argue with you about that or not. I'm saying it is every reason strategically for us to emphasize that we are talking about elective abortion because yep. first of all, we are. And right. secondly, the average American who's not super into this debate, they feel very differently about elective abortion than medically necessary abortion. And they feel differently about yeah. us based on if they think we're talking about one or the other. Yeah. So there are a bunch of reasons that we have incentive to make this delineation. And if you need proof, all you got to do is look at ACOG asking us not to make this delineation. Do you have an article or something about yes, the ACOG I thing? Yes, I do have Good. an article about this. I'm so glad. It is called, what I'll, is it called? I'll link to it in the description. Hold on a second. Okay. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> it is called... And by the way, this article took me forever to write. And okay. I told you I'm very conscientious about my time. And there was a part of me that was like, why am I doing this? I shouldn't be spending this much time on this. But I was so mad. No, this is interesting. It's called ACOG Has Spoken. 13 phrases we no longer are supposed to use regarding abortion. Oh, that's okay? a good title. And there, there was one phrase that they gave a medical justification for, and that was late-term abortion versus later abortion. Now, personally, I don't feel strongly about this. No. I will say either one. I've started saying later abortion more often. Actually, what I usually do— I'm, I haven't I, heard I will that tell one. you in a second, but I will say okay. what I usually do is I don't even use either one of those. They're both vague. I just say— 21 weeks or later, yeah. third trimester. That's like even just, better. Just say what, what you're doing. Yes. But the reason they are giving— is that in terms of pregnancy, when you talk about term, you're talking about when you get to term, you're getting to where you're supposed to be having the baby. And so, you know, in that regard, term would be 40 weeks or 38 to 42 weeks or whatever. So late term would be after 40 weeks. And they are accusing us of trying to say that these abortions are happening after birth. That's not what we're saying. You could show a strong history of us and the other side using late term abortion to broadly mean... 21 weeks or later, post viability, that kind of thing. Right. You can, and to be fair, they always fight the born alive and think kind of legislation. Yes, also that. But too. I'm saying the internet is forever, and we have the receipts of Planned Parenthood, NARAL. Yep. Even now, there are still journalists who will say late term abortion, and they're pro choice journalists. We, but now they're saying you guys made that up to confuse and prejudice people against us. And I'm like, okay, what do you want me to say so I can make my point? I don't even care. And so that was the only one where they were like, medically, term means this, so late term means that, so you're a big meanie, and you should say later abortion instead. So fine. I've started saying later abortion more often in my stuff, depending on the context. Yeah. The other 12 phrases they list, you know what? Hold on a second. Okay. I will tell you. I will okay. tell you what they said. These are what they don't want you to say. Are you ready? Yeah. Chemical abortion, surgical abortion, heartbeat bill, fetal heartbeat, dismemberment ban, abortion provider, baby or unborn child, that's an old one. Self-induced abortion, elective abortion, partial birth abortion, womb, or abortion on demand. So let me reemphasize really quick. They don't want you to say mm -hmm. chemical abortion, surgical abortion, um, self-induced abortion, elective abortion, or partial birth abortion. Because basically, and you can read the details here. I went into great detail on every single one with lots of sources, yeah. including the up-to-date database and all sort, all the details you could possibly want. But what it comes down to is they don't want people to have details on abortion. Right. They just want them to accept it as healthcare. Period. The more the full people stop. Are thinking about yes. what it is. 
Yep. They don't want you to think about hearts and heartbeats for sure. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to think about, they didn't mention this specifically here, but they don't want you to think about fetal pain. Yep. They don't want you to think about the different kinds of abortion and the different reasons women get them. And by the yep. way, like, let's say that you are fine morally with abortion. Let's yep. say that you are, okay? This is still absurd because you yeah. should care. That's what I was going to say. This, you should How care. How do you feel about the fact that your site is clearly... Like, trying la, 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 to la, la, la. clean up the well, language. Well, not just that. Not even just that. Not even just how much you want to obfuscate everything, okay? But let's say you're a moderate pro-choice person. You don't think abortion is morally wrong per se. Maybe maybe later, but definitely not earlier. And you and you sympathize with the reasons women want to get one. Yeah. You should still care why women are getting them. Because there's some non-zero percentage of women who are getting them because they feel like they don't have a choice. Right. And we can't possibly talk about that or examine what's going on with the party or the side that's like, uh, we don't need to give the CDC data about abortion. We don't need to offer women the option to mm. view the ultrasound. We don't need to be reading fetal development info. We don't need to be asking them why they're getting it. Every time we try to do just a data collection thing, not a restriction, but just like a broadly speaking, we just did this in Colorado recently where they proposed a bill that said, hey, Colorado has no limits on abortion, gestational limits, none. It's not like after 24 weeks, you have to have a broad health exception. It's just like there's not a gestational limit. So in Colorado, we would like to gather data on who is getting abortions at what gestational ages? And when mm -hmm. I say who, I don't mean people's names. I mean the number of women getting them at different gestational ages and then give them whatever you want, 5, 10, 15 options as to why and have them say kind of why they're doing it. And you could see as it gets later why they're doing it. You yeah. know, people are always like, oh, where's the data to show elective late-term abortion is happening? And first of all, there is data, first of all. But it's very hard to find. And you know why it's hard to find? Not because of us. We are not against gathering that data. Someone is against gathering that data. It's not us. And you should care if you're a moderate pro-choice yep. person. You should care why a woman would want to get an abortion at 28 weeks. That should be concerning. Maybe it is because she really, 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 really doesn't want this pregnancy for various reasons. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Do you care if it's not? Do you mm -hmm. care if she's going to get a 28-week abortion, which she really doesn't want to get? Do you want to find out why and address those issues? Mm -hmm. Or are you afraid if we talk about that, that it undermines the right to abortion generally? So throw her under the bus because abortion rights above all. I think we all know the answer already. Yeah. Yeah. So when they try to control the language, the language controls the way the conversation goes. And so I agree with you that we should be very intentional, the unforced error of being confusing about what we mean by abortion. And they want us to be confusing about that. They right. want us to be vague and confusing about that don't so that they can, their hands. yeah, so that they could be like, you don't care if a woman dies from an ectopic pregnancy and you're over here like, can we just not dismember 15 week fetuses for no medical reason? <laughs> can we not? Right. They don't want to talk about that. All right. So I've only got one more on here. We were, or again, we're past an hour now. Okay. So, of course we are. So to recap, so we need to be very careful about including clear life of the mother exceptions in the actual bills. Yes. Um, which means that maybe pro-lifers were using the word abortion sometimes in a way that you don't like. And, but if that's the clearest way to do the legislation, if that is the, if, if that's the way that makes it hardest for the, the pro-choice doctors on TikTok to say there's this chilling effect and now I can't save people's lives. To be clear, Fine. they will say it either way, but it's harder to make sure, them. But it's make harder it for them to be persuasive. Possible. Make it seem ridiculous yes. for them to say that. Exactly. Okay, so we got that. Um, we every time the pro-lifer describes their view, they need to include a clear life of the mother exception kind of a statement. No, I in just it. say and for I, no medical reason. And the for way no that you medical did reason it is the best way. Re re repeat. The, what do you the line? think about abortions on healthy fetuses carried by healthy women for no medical reason? That's the line. Memorize it. Add it to your pro-life pitch. We need to be more careful about how we define abortion. And then lastly, we need to understand why we shouldn't prosecute women for illegal abortion. Oh, that's, any, you want to get that done in less than an hour? Soon. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'll point to an article. We explain sure. basically why our view is this. We are trying to basically add nuance to both sides of this debate. Because sure. I think, I think generally speaking, almost everyone who talks about this it is lacking too much nuance on one side of a spectrum and we're trying to like here's a more nuanced middle yes option. but also take hope here talking to get about that bell curve of activism yeah um i think a lot of times when we get into nuanced discussions about this we are dealing with the tails because similar to yeah. when you're dealing with the average That's american true. and they're saying do you think there should be a life of the mother exception and they're sincere and you're just like yes i do similarly mm -hmm. if they say do you want to prosecute women? A lot of them are sincere. They're not trying to get a gotcha. If you say no, you don't really care. And if you say yes, you're yeah. evil. They really, do you want to prosecute women? No. Okay. Let's talk then. Right. But the problem is now, for whatever reasons, 
that, that there are more and more loud voices that are on the pro-prosecution side. Well, because Roe is, is gone. So now that's an actual thing that you could even conceivably talk about. Before Roe, it was like, right. it was it was a assuming a frictionless surface coffee house conversation. Right. Now it's like a thing that could theoretically again, the happen. The other side is the one that wants us all focusing on what exactly should we do if abortion becomes legal? What should we do to oh this Oh my woman? gosh, they I read another piece that. of research recently where they interviewed a whole bunch of average American pro-life people. Mm-hmm. So again, not activists you know, do you think there should be a penalty and what should it be? And, and what they actually found was that most of them were like, maybe some, I don't know. And it wasn't, it wasn't, most of them, it was not related to jail. It was like maybe like a fine or community service or a class or like, they thought there should be something. They weren't sure what it was. And they concluded from that, not that, oh, they definitely don't want to prosecute women, but that, um, these guys just don't know what they think about things. And I'm like, I mean, you're not, you're not totally wrong that you could pick an average pro-life person and they won't have every answer to every single thing, oh, no. but you yeah. won't, you refuse to see that it's because they're not motivated by hating women. You refuse to see that. If right. it really was that they just hated women, why wouldn't they just be like, yep, jail, done. Why would most pro-lifers have actually spent a ton of time trying to figure out exactly what should happen in this situation when they haven't thought it's remotely possible in their entire lifetime? Right. Like, it's not that weird that this is one that a lot of pro-lifers Well, and it's another one of those asymmetric things where we suffer from scrutinizing our view and you should scrutinize our view but there's nobody scrutinizing the other side and so then people who are only listening to one set of information are like oh well they don't they don't know what they think they don't know what they want to do and they have these bad answers but nobody's asking you about and i will say it again about uh late-term elective abortion every time you want to ask me about the implications of conception bans ivf contraception all of those things that's fine. You're not wrong to ask me. Mm-hmm. But if you ask me that and you're not asking anybody about um, six month, seven month for no medical reason, then I don't take you seriously. We should have to defend the Gotta extreme parts of our view. Honesty. And so should, and the yeah. thing is, you are talking about theoretically, you're talking about what, to, what if in the future we ban IVF clinics? I'm talking about literally right now, right. every day, every day, right now for years. This has already been happening. And you're like, what if your implications are really terrible in the future? Okay, what if your implications are really terrible right now while right, we're talking? Right. What if you were dismembering six month fetuses and no one really knows about it? Like, yeah. Like, like, what, what if that what was happening? About that? Yeah. What if? What if? Just hypothetically, hypothetically, <laughs> if they if they could live outside the womb and you decided to inject a poison into their heart first to make sure that didn't happen, hypothetically. And then birth them. Like, how would you feel about that? Right. And I can tell you 95% of the time, the answer is that doesn't happen. Yeah. And whenever that happens, let's say, I point them to your website. Let's say it doesn't happen. Can you answer the question? Because nobody's banned an IVF clinic yet either. And I'm still, I'm not like, nobody's banning that. So I'm not going to answer you. Right. Well, actually, some people are like that. What's, to be what's fair. the question for me? <laughs> I'm saying when you're having conversations where you want the you want your opposition to defend or at least examine the mm-hmm. hard edges of their case i'm fine with that if we're doing it in both directions yes. so when someone yeah. wants me to say oh do you think we should shut down ivf clinics right. do you want me to just be like well we haven't okay no. but do you think we should okay but right. we haven't of course we, we have not answer the question right yeah. just answer the question but then i'm like okay what about elective to oh nobody does that okay but would you have a problem with it well, nobody does that okay you would have a problem wouldn't you I, it's okay to say that we have common ground here. Right. This is we both agree that this right. is a freaking and terrible, do you horrible think thing. That this whole list of abortion doctors and people who've had the abortions are lying. No, no, no. They, say they don't think they're lying. They think I'm dumb. I'm misunderstanding them. How can you misunderstand? Because, because Josh, abortion just means ending a pregnancy. Too many good questions right now. Abortion just means ending a pregnancy. It doesn't mean that anybody has to die. That's just an anti-abortion myth. We are just vilifying abortion to say that it is about purposely killing anyone. So when the DuPont Clinic in Washington, D.C. has a section on their website mm-hmm. that says 26 plus week abortions, no medical reason. We don't care what the reason is, whatever you want. And I point them to that. They're like, yeah, because that's just labor induction and the NICU. That's what they think. They think that I don't understand the clinic correctly because when they say abortion, they just mean early termination so of pregnancy. I'll, I'll just say again. So, so and, and I've said this before, if they're going to reject your view or your argument, you want it to be for the dumbest, most intellectually dishonest reason ever. You don't want it to be because it you've been is. a jerk or too weird or because you made a logical fallacy or you made some bad argument or something like that. You want it to be... They are being flagrantly intellectually dishonest. Yeah. Because then it's going to be more likely that they can't 
sustain well, that for their entire life. Getting back to what we were speaking about before, if this is happening online, don't feel like you have to get them to admit what you're saying. You totally don't. Yeah. You could say, look at the DuPont clinic, and they'll be like, oh, they just mean labor induction to NICU. And you're like, yeah. okay. And you almost, can stop. You can stop. No one is willing to admit they're wrong in public. Well, I'm that, saying you don't have to side. keep going. You can stop right. because if your target audience is the average, reasonably intellectually honest person, and they see that response, they're going to be like, yeah. That seems implausible. And you don't have to do anything else, yep. okay? Yep. We've gotten on a tangent. Okay. We need to stop. <laughs> we have <laughs> we've, to stop. We've covered it. We've got many more episodes to film. And so we're going to bring this one to a close. I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks for being here. And I can't wait for the next one. Yes. Thanks for letting me just rant and rant. <laughs> My favorite thing. <laughs>